This is the story of TWA Airlines Flight 514. The story of aviation is littered with accidents, some big and some small, but all of them had an impact on aviation. The story of TWA 514 might not be as famous or as widespread as the Tenerife disaster or TWA 800, but I would argue that it played a much bigger part in aviation safety than any of those crashes. But before we get into the story of TWA Flight 514, a word from our sponsor, Blinkist. Look, none of us have a lot of time on our hands. With work and studies and housework, you might not really get the time to sit down and read a good book or to peruse an article or a podcast that you really want to. If you feel the same way, then the Blinkist app is for you. Blinkist serves up the main points of a book or podcast in about 15 minutes so that you can broaden your horizons on the go improving yourself. Listen to thought-provoking snippets while at the gym, in the kitchen, or while walking your dog. I mean, it's 2023, and I've heard all of your feedback about my scripts being sometimes a little bit repetitive. That is why I've been listening to On Writing Well by William Sinzer on Blinkist. So yeah, I want to become a better communicator in 2023. What about you? If all of that wasn't great enough, you can now share your Blinkist Premium account with another person with Blinkist Connect at no additional cost. So you and your significant other, friend, or whoever you choose both get your own accounts and nothing is shared between them except the great books that you find. Get 25% off of Blinkist Premium and get two premium accounts for the price of one with the link in the description. Again, Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. On the 1st of December 1974, a TWA 727 was on the way from Indianapolis International Airport to Washington National Airport with a stopover in Port Columbus International Airport in Ohio. The flight to Columbus went off without a hitch, and when the plane took off from Columbus, they had 85 people on board and 7 crew members. Although the flight departed Columbus a bit late, it was nothing that the pilots couldn't make up en route. But at 10.36 a.m., the pilots got some bad news from the controllers on the ground at Cleveland. They said that no planes were landing at Washington National Airport due to high crosswinds. Due to the high crosswinds, everyone was diverting or being put into a hold. The captain of flight 514 got on the phone with the dispatcher. He needed more information to decide what to do. After talking to the dispatcher, they decided to divert to Washington Dulles International Airport, as the winds were more favorable there. Cleveland ATC then asked Flight 514 to descend down to 23,000 feet, and after a while, control was handed off to Washington ARTCC. As the plane was being handed off from one ATC region to the other, the pilots went over the approach that they would be flying into Dulles International. They talked about the runway that they would be landing on, in this case, runway 12 and the navigational aids that they would be using to land. After those discussions were done, the captain handed the 727 off to the first officer. Now he would be the one making the landing. As they got in touch with Washington ATC, the pilots discussed the possible routings that they might get from the controller and how they would go about that approach. At 10.51 a.m., the controller wanted to know what heading Flight 514 was on, and the pilots told them that they were on a heading of 100 degrees. The controller wanted them to turn left to 090 degrees. This would allow them to intercept the 300 radial of the VOR in the area. It was called RMAL. This would set them up nicely for a straightened approach to runway 12. Now, that last bit had a bunch of terminology. A VOR is a beacon that pilots use to navigate. Think of radials as 360 spokes coming off the VOR beacon in every direction. Flying along a radial takes you away or towards the VOR in a particular way. It's as simple as that. With the landing information received, the pilots started prepping the plane for landing. As they did the math needed for the landing, a landing reference speed of 127 knots was set. All this while the crew went over even more details of the landing, like the runway lights, the intersections that they need to fly through, and the airport diagram. As the plane left 11,000 feet for 8,000 feet, the captain asked the controller if the controller could see any weather between the plane and the runway, and the controller said that he couldn't see anything significant. The captain turned on the anti-ice just to be safe. After all, you can never be too safe. Soon after that, the pilots got their landing clearance, and the pilots started to take the huge bird down, 
keeping an eye on the altimeter. As the approach was being flown, the first officer remarked, I hate the altitude just jumping around. And he also commented that the instrument panel was jumping around. Apparently, they had a slight discrepancy in the VOR readings in the cockpit. The captain asked the first officer to fly the plane based off of the first officer's VOR instruments and not the captain's. The captain was now looking at the ceiling of the clouds, trying to figure out when they'd be able to break out through the clouds. The first officer, meanwhile, was getting annoyed with the altitude needle just jumping around like that. He said, gives you a headache after a while, watching this jumping around like that. Soon they were at their initial approach fix, so they started to take the plane down from 2800 feet to 1800 feet. As the plane dove deeper into the clouds, the plane was enveloped in darkness, and things got a lot more bumpy. Then, the altitude alert horn sounded. The captain and the first officer were both starting to get glimpses of the ground. But this unnerved the pilots a bit. The first officer added power and the captain remarked that they had a high sink rate. The flight engineer just said, we're getting seasick. Then, the altitude alert sounded again. The first officer said, boy, it was expletive. Wanted to go right through down there, man. Must have had a expletive of a downdraft. 17 seconds after that, the radio altimeter warning horn went off and the first officer just said, boy, and the captain urged, get some power on, and then impact. The controller still had no idea what happened. He tried reaching flight 514. He said, TWA 514, say your altitude, but no reply came. So he tried again. Again, no reply. Flight 514 had crashed, and soon he'd find out. The plane had impacted the west slope of Mount Weather, and they needed to find out why the plane was so far off course and below its target altitude of 1,800 feet. You see, if they had stayed at 1,800 feet, then all of this could have been avoided. The first thing that the investigators considered was a plane that was led astray by erroneous altimeter readings. But the flight data readouts from the plane showed that the data that the pilots were seeing was accurate. So the pilots knew their altitude. So how did the plane end up flying into a mountainside? Even more confusingly, on the cockpit voice recorder, the investigators could hear the sound of the radio altimeter. The radio altimeter made a sound when the plane was 500 feet above the ground, and then again when it was 100 feet above the ground. The first sound was heard seven seconds before impact, and the second one was heard one second before impact. The captain acted as fast as possible, but it was too little too late to save the plane. This left a one scenario. The pilots descended below 1,800 feet knowingly. Now, that is almost unthinkable. The pilots knew from the charts that they had that the area that they were in had tall mountains that extended to almost 1,800 feet. Descending below that would be super dangerous. So why did they do it? This is where the investigators uncovered a massive misunderstanding between the pilots and the air traffic controllers. The captain believed that he was in a radar environment, which would mean that the controller would be keeping an eye on the plane with radar. And since he was in a radar environment, he thought he would be able to make an unrestricted descent all the way down to the final approach fix. The final approach fix is a waypoint near the runway that you have to be at at a particular speed, heading, and altitude. It is imperative that you do that. So, in the captain's mind, when he heard the term cleared for approach, he assumed that he was now cleared to descend all the way down to the final approach fix because in his mind, if they needed to maintain 1800 feet until a certain point, then the controller would say something like cleared for approach, maintain 1800 feet until so-and-so waypoint, then descend. The USAF and TWA both brought up this cleared approach phrase as a source of confusion between pilots and controllers, and they were right. Just six weeks ago, this very same thing happened to a United Airlines plane, and they had made the very same misunderstanding, and that plane almost flew into a mountain in the very same way. The captain also had charts at his disposal that showed that they were in a mountainous area. You see, when they got the approach clearance, the pilots were tuned to the RMAL VOR, and they were 44 nautical miles away. Looking up that region on their charts would have shown that they were in a high-terrain environment, but it is very possible that the crew was focused on another area of the chart. They just assumed that they were safe. They expected the controllers to keep them safe. 
The investigators then turned their attention to the ATC system and the role that air traffic controllers had in this accident. The air traffic controllers were treating Flight 514 as a non-radar arrival, so they assumed that the pilots would do the work of obstacle avoidance. You're starting to see the problem here, right? Here's the crux of the misunderstanding. The controllers did not consider Flight 514 as a radar arrival because they had not vectored the flight to the final approach fix. The controllers did not consider the whole fly along the 300 radial of the Armel VOR thing as vectoring per se, and the pilots could have mistaken that for radar vectoring. The really shocking thing about all of this is that ATC procedures are all based on phrases and words, and those words mean different things to pilots and controllers. For example, take the phrase radar control. The pilots who were interviewed for this investigation all wholeheartedly thought that that phrase meant that they would be in a radar control environment. But the controllers who were interviewed knew that that always wasn't the case. This clearly showed the gap in understanding of very important phrases between pilots and controllers. These phrases should have been standardized, but they were not, and that's a major problem for all involved. Here's a quote from the report. The board believes that the clearance under these circumstances should have included an altitude restriction until the aircraft had reached a segment of the published approach procedure or the issuance of the approach clearance should have been deferred until the flight reached such a segment. Therefore, the safety board concludes that the clearance was inadequate and its issuance and acceptance was the result of a misunderstanding between the pilot and the controller. End quote. This might seem almost shocking, but it was only after this crash that people went, you know what, maybe we should standardize phrases and lexicon so that someone doesn't misinterpret this down the line. This seems so obvious to us right now, but like they always say, hindsight is 2020. Here's another quote from the report. Additionally, there should be one book of procedures for use by pilots and controllers so that each will understand what to expect of the other in all air traffic control situations. This manual must be used in training of all pilots and controllers. This accident ultimately made flying safer. Due to the crash of Flight 514, gaping holes in the system were found and rectified. In your opinion, who was in the wrong here? Some people point the finger towards the air traffic controllers, and some people think that it was the pilots who were at fault. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.